All right, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, Code Red, behind the scenes of an award-winning investigative journalism project. Uh, my name is Katie Owney. I'm the Assistant Dean for External Relations at Philip Merrill College of Journalism at the University of Maryland. Um, and I'm thrilled to have with us uh, this evening um, a tremendous panel of uh, both our faculty and uh, several of our, our students and recent graduates who worked on the Code Red project, um, which as you'll hear from uh, Kathy Best in a couple of minutes, has won um, a number of professional reporting awards. Um, so these are awards that are given to professional journalists and our students um, have picked up a number of them uh, through this project. So we're, we're tremendously proud of it. Um, just a couple of housekeeping notes before we get going. Um, first of all, um, we just ask that you all uh, keep yourselves muted and keep your video off throughout the duration of the program. Um, if you do have questions for the panel, uh, we encourage you to submit those using the chat function and we'll try to um, allow some time at the end to get to those. Um, and we will be recording this, so just be aware of that um, and we'll have the full recording up on our YouTube channel for Merrill College um, probably by sometime tomorrow. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Kathy Best. Kathy is the director of our Howard Center for Investigative Journalism. Um, I believe this is about your one year anniversary, I think, Kathy, <laughs> this yeah. week. So um, Kathy joined us last year about this time. Um, we officially launched the Howard Center um, with the support of the Scripps Howard Foundation um, this past fall. And the Code Red project is, is the first project to come out of that. So um, I'm going to turn things over to Kathy. Thank you, Katie. And thank you all for uh, joining us tonight. Um, it's great weather for staying inside. Boy, is it miserable out there. Anyway, tonight um, we're gonna take you behind the scenes of Code Red, which was an investigation that measured the impact of a warming climate on urban heat islands. We showed that these typically poor inner city neighborhoods with lots of concrete and very few trees would bear the brunt of a warming globe. This was our first project um, produced by the University of Maryland's new Howard Center for Investigative Journalism. We spent last summer working with NPR, Wide Angle Youth Media in Baltimore, the University of Maryland's Capital News Service, and WMAR in Baltimore. The results we found were stunning, and much to our surprise and delight, the work attracted audiences across the U.S. and even around the world. It also won plaudits from our colleagues. So far, Code Red has won four national awards for innovative storytelling from the Scripps Howard Foundation, the National Press Foundation, the News Leaders Association, and Investigative Reporters and Editors National Institute for Computer Assisted Reporting. These are professional, not student, competitions. The coronavirus pandemic temporarily has turned the spotlight away from climate change, but that doesn't mean the growing climate crisis has gone away, and we want to turn the spotlight back, at least for tonight. With summer just around the corner, we also wanted to remind you of what's coming. I'm joined tonight by three of my Merrill College colleagues and three of our students, all of whom worked on this project. As a matter of fact, they're the people who actually did the work on this project. Sandy Beniski is the abled professor of Baltimore journalism and a former top editor at the Baltimore Sun. Sean Mussenden is the Howard Center's data editor and a former Washington correspondent for two Florida news organizations. Krishnan Vasudevan is an assistant professor of visual communication and, and a filmmaker whose work has appeared on Slate and in the New York Times. Each was instrumental in making this project happen. We also have three recent graduates of Merrill College, Camilla Veloso and Teresa Diffendahl from the master's program and Maris Medina from the undergraduate program. They analyze data, they, uh, they built graphics, uh, they built web pages, they did on the ground reporting, they took pictures, 
and mostly they hit the hot, steamy streets of Baltimore in the middle of last summer to make this project possible. But while this work grew out of a record-breaking summer, it had roots in a cold Baltimore winter. Sean and Krishnan, could you talk a little bit about the genesis of this project and, and, and excuse me, how did you hear about the heat and humidity sensors that helped us tell this story? Sure, thanks, Kathy. So, um, hey everybody, I'm Sean Mussenden from the Howard Center. Um, so, uh, for two to three years prior to working on this project, um, we at the college, um, uh, mostly working in conjunction with um, Sandy Benitsky and me and uh, some other faculty members, um, we had focused a lot on issues of health equity um, and used um, stories in Baltimore to to tell uh, uh, to report that issue out. So as is true in Baltimore, um, in many other cities, um, richer, whiter neighborhoods by several health metrics tend to live longer, healthier lives than uh, poorer uh, minority neighborhoods. So uh, in previous stories, we focused on um, inequality and in asthma rates, unequal access to healthcare services, and some other things. Um, uh, about a year and a half, two years ago now, we were also interested in doing a kind of a big project about um, what uh, we maybe still think is the most important issue of our time, despite the fact that uh, COVID-19 has pushed coverage of this uh, off a little bit, which is climate change. Um, and uh, Krishnan and I, um, just kind of kicking around some ideas one day, um, have been trying to figure out a way to make use of low cost sensors uh, to build our own data sets. Um, and we were able to do that initially by Katie showing a, a package called Bitter Cold. Um, we built these, these little sensors to um, collect temperature information inside of people's homes in Baltimore in the winter people without heat and use that to tell stories. And that served as a, a testing ground of sorts to make sure that our sensor technology worked um, ahead of being able to put these low cost sensors that measured uh, heat and humidity in people's homes um, in the summer. Um, uh, Krishnan, do you wanna talk a little bit about um, sensor journalism and, and how we build our sensors and all that? Sure, yeah. Um, so one of the exciting parts about being a journalist right now is that so much of what you need to know is being uh, put online in spaces like GitHub or in wiki pages. And journalists, especially the data journalism and the computational journalism community, uh, are really open with their, their code and their data sets. Um, and that's really helpful for us who had this idea. Um, and we probably could have figured it out on our own, but John Keefe of WNYC had led this project called Harlem Heat in 2016, in which they did a very similar thing. They built these low cost temperature monitors um, with a team, uh, with a community organization and um, put them in people's homes to understand what people were enduring this summer. So we really were able to you know, model our project as at least the sensor aspect off of the Harlem Heat project. And, um, you know, uh, this allowed us really to get the, the ball rolling. Um, and we were able to buy all the parts online. Um, and then we'll get into kind of how we put them together in, in, a, in a few minutes. Yeah. Katie, could you play the, uh, the video on how the sensors were built? Or if not, we can skip that and uh, and move on. <clears throat> so I think I can. just just one second here. Sorry, okay. I was having a technical okay. okay. difficulty. Yeah, there's a good picture of one of the the pieces of tech that went into making it. A computer, a temperature monitor, uh, a clock, um, uh, an SD card reader we can build this temperature data logger that we can put in the field, put in someone's home, and over the course of six weeks, we can take readings every 10 seconds. I what like we're doing today do is putting those parts together. My role. Um, 
so what you, you saw just there was um, a, a group of students. Uh, we brought them together. And one of the best parts about being at a research university is that we have all of this access to space. And uh, we were able to develop a relationship uh, with Terrapin Works, um, who run, run the maker spaces on campus. And they allowed us to basically uh, take all of these parts work with our student reporters and our editors. And we created this assembly line one day early uh, last summer and then pr previously in the winter. And we just put these together. Students who'd never soldered before, Teresa being one of them, um, had, you know, were soldering things. And so it was an exciting uh, time. And it, it's also a testament to the fact that, yeah, these are complicated gadgets, but if you can break it down, create easy to understand, um, instructions and you really can make something complicated like this come together. Um, so uh, we built these sensors um, in, in the maker spaces and having that was was awesome. So that's kind of how they came together. That's and Chris, now if I can, uh, Kathy, if I can just add too, in addition to journalism students who were involved in the construction of these, um, high school students and medical, middle school students from our partner Wide Angle Youth Media um, mostly um, students from underserved neighborhoods in, in, um, in Baltimore um, also helped us build. I read in New York City they decided after some anecdotal evidence that the number one way to reduce crime was to give people individual air conditioning units in their apartments. Yeah, I think I've read that too. Just. Hmm. Okay. Um, so, Sandy, do you want to um, to talk about how uh, how um, your students talked to people in McElderry Park in Baltimore into letting us place these sensors in their homes? And um, how did you coach your students on how to build trust? Uh, well, um, first we started just about this time last year um, trying to figure out how to find people to talk to. We knew, thanks to Sean and Sean's students, that McElderry Park is the hottest neighborhood in Baltimore. So um, that was sort of our opening line. And uh, this weekend last year, one of the students found there was a block festival in McElderry Park. And on our way there, there was a corner, a street corner church with the door open and a couple of people were planting outside the church. So I pulled the car over, and we went in and started talking to these very nice people who would lived in the neighborhood a very long time and um, told them what we were about. And almost everybody we talked to when we started with, you live in the hottest neighborhood in the city. Thank you, Sean, for that opening line, at least wanted to hear more. Several people said, that's interesting, no thank you. You seem like nice people, no thanks. But as you can see here, one of our reporters talking with um, uh, a woman who was sitting outside her house on a bench. And one of our students went over and sat and said, here's who I am. Those are the, that's the rest of my team across the street. And um, we spent time talking, introducing ourselves, talking about the project. Sometimes we didn't even mention sensors in the first meeting. Sometimes we said, can we come back and talk to you again next week when it might be hotter? Um, and then we would talk about sensors and most people were intrigued to learn about it. So Krishnan and Sean um, uh, explained to us this was not being recorded. It was not going to the CIA. It was self-contained. It only recorded within itself. And um, a lot of people said, sure, I'd like to hear. So that meant then that we got to come back every couple of weeks to collect data, which we explained to them. And that allowed us to check in for more storytelling. Um, how did the last couple of weeks go? How do you feel? And we got plenty of little stories about, it was so hot in my house one night, I said to my husband, I can't finish cooking dinner. Um, it was so hot upstairs that uh, I couldn't breathe. So, um, we built trust just by letting people hear us, talk to us, see what we were about, and taking our time getting to know them. That's great, thank you. Um, Sean, this project relied heavily on data. Um, what data sets ended up being the most important? Because you had several to choose from. 
Yeah, so uh, this project really was a, a data journalist dream. It um, uh, easily more than a dozen discrete data sets that we used. I'll, only, I'll spare you all by only talking about a few. Um, and the important thing was uh, that this data um, helped lead us to, um, uh, to neighborhoods and to people and characters who really brought it to life. So um, three things come to mind. Um, the first is um, this, the original sensor data. We were capturing data that nobody else had because we were placing these little um, tech objects inside of people's homes, recorded to an SD card, a little, little um, uh, data, data logger that recorded every, every 10 minutes temperature and humidity. Um, and we use this to show things like the heat index inside of a, a child's bedroom reached 118 degrees. Um, we were also able to say that um, often it was as much as 20 degrees hotter inside than outside. And this was especially true at night. Um, we wrote some, some custom software uh, and Teresa, who's on the call here, led, a, led an effort to build um, a software tool that will allow other people to build on our work um, in the future. Uh, so the temperature data was really important. Um, another data set that was really important is we worked with some researchers uh, from Virginia who in several cities across the country had captured um, very detailed block by block temperature data during the previous summer to when we did this project. Um, they strapped temperature sensors on top of station wagons and bikes and rode all over the city. Um, and we were able to join that, which is a very common, common thing we do, um, with census data uh, to show that the hottest neighborhoods in the city were also the poorest and to identify our you know, main reporting neighborhood in the Keldery Park as the hottest. Um, lastly, uh, we worked with NPR pretty closely on this story. We told a very deep dive into Baltimore and they um, worked with us to, to nationalize this project. And so they used the method we developed to um, uh, uh, look at the relationship between poverty and heat in nearly 100 cities by using um, remote sensed satellite data. Um, and we saw this relationship basically everywhere we looked. Uh, there was a lot more data, um, tree cover satellite data, um, daily temperature data, and also global climate data to show how much Baltimore had warmed over the previous century. Great, thank you. Um, Sandy, you recruited John Fairhall, who was a former colleague from The Sun and, uh, and an editor at Kaiser Health News to work on this project with us. He focused on the health impacts of high heat and humidity and worked with students to tell that story. How important was that to the project? Oh, it was fundamentally important. So besides John's being a very smart, Baltimore veteran reporter and editor, he also has this deep knowledge about health. And um, it's kind of intuitive that in the heat, you don't want to have a lung condition. It's hard to breathe. Um, you probably don't want to be old with a heart condition. But um, John also understood that um, uh, if you're diabetic, a lot of um, insulin, your insulin levels are affected. A lot of other medications work differently when your body is trying to regulate and cope with heat. Um, and John also focused on mental health, the stress, the anxiety. And if you're on um, medications for um, any kind of uh, emotional issues, how those could be thrown off kilter as well. John also, we just passed the, the picture of the, um, emergency room doctor. John got a, thank you, Katie. John got an interview um, with uh, this doctor at the Johns Hopkins Hospital at 8 a.m. Um, he had just worked all night. This was Dr. Matthew Levy, had worked all night, um, sat for photographs with our one of our photographers, Maris's um, colleague, Amina, who on the Friday of that heat wave, on a day where it would be 98 degrees, Dr. Levy uh, talked about how patients who arrive in the hospital during heat waves need to be hospitalized longer. People who thought their health was stable often suddenly present with a heart attack. Um, uh, and that dehydration affects everybody in ways that we don't even think about. So uh, John's um, depth of knowledge there and his ability to guide this, this story was really fundamentally important. Thank you. 
Maris, what obstacles did you have to overcome to produce the visual journalism, which included still photos and video, and, and we even um, got someone to come in and help us with drone video? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think what was so great about this uh, overall story was that there was such a great space for visual journalism. Um, with that being said, like, there definitely were a couple of challenges from the beginning that Amina and I and uh, Tim, we all had to pretty much overcome to get this great journalism out. Um, I think from the beginning, um, Amina and I really had to learn how to navigate being around McAldery Park and talking to the residents without having... Um, already like established the relationships with them that the reporters have had um, like weeks prior to like being us being there. Um, so even I think on the first day we just kind of walked around and tried to get a lay of the land and um, said hi to a, a bunch of the residents to really start building those relationships. Um, we didn't want to be like the strangers in the neighborhood with cameras like taking photos of everyone, um, especially you know, this is such a sensitive story and topic that we did want to have those relationships first. Um, and then we found that sometimes like having a camera was a little bit intrusive when we were interviewing the residents because, you know, you're pointing it at their faces. And we really had to learn when it was appropriate to pull out a camera um, while they were talking to, you know, to, uh, to take these portraits. Um, but I think to overcome that barrier, we really tried to listen first. Um, oftentimes we were paired with uh, like a reporter or a writer from the story. Um, so we just decided that yeah, to, for right now, we're just going to sit down and talk to residents and like maybe ask them to take photo afterwards because once you had that relationship already built, it was a lot easier to navigate taking portraits or any photos of them. Um, and yeah, I think I think we really learned how to do uh, depict such a sensitive topic or sensitive story um, in a very honest way. We found that you know sometimes if they were talking about their health issues or let's say like how hard it was to live without air conditioning in Baltimore, um, we definitely just learned how to take a step back and you know find those moments that were really raw, really honest, but you know still respecting their privacy. Right. And were there any images that that you think really captured that long, hot summer well? Yeah, um, right now, actually, uh, you're looking at a photo taken by Amina. Um, she was the other photographer on the team. And this this day, actually, uh, they uh, Tim and Amina actually planned to just meet at that intersection. And by fate, they happened to be next to the snow cone stand. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, it wasn't even planned. Um, so it was great that they were able to get these photos. But yeah, these really showed how, um, you know, people were trying to stay cool um, with snow cones. And then there's also a photo of a, a boy uh, selling water bottles. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that really does illustrate how, you know, how long, how hot that summer was. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Camilla, once we had the sensor data in hand, could you talk about how your team turned it into a graphic? Sure. Uh, thank you for your question and, and for inviting me uh, to the panel. Sure. Um, so the sensor data painted a pretty startling picture, uh, like Sean mentioned. And because the information coming out of the sensor data, um, notably that it was hotter outside than inside, was so compelling that we felt it was important to showcase it, not just as figures uh, in the story and the text of the story, but also as a standalone visual. Um, so Adam Martin, who was my editor on the project, uh, brilliantly designed the indoor-outdoor heat index graphic uh, that you're currently seeing on the screen. Um, and it's done through a device called story, Scrolly Telling, um, which serves to transform and sort of enhance the story into an interactive experience for the readers. Um, so with every scroll, there's a new piece of information that's revealed, and it rolls out the details of a story um, in just a way that's meant to be engaging and keep people reading. Um, so this particular graphic um, slowly unfolds the story inside Stephanie uh, Pingley's home. Um, and how during the heat wave uh, last July, the heat index was consistently higher uh, in her house by about 10 degrees. Uh, so really this graphic is meant to leave uh, an impression on the readers so that they remember this information even after uh, they exit the project page. That's great. Um, and did you guys come up with the name Scrolly Telling or? or no. <laughs> no, 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 that was already out there. Okay. Okay, because it's a very cool name. So 
could you and Krishnan talk about um, where the idea came from for the motion graphic explaining why row houses get so hot? And, and why was that an effective storytelling device, do you think? Um, and Camilla, if, if you wanna talk about the, uh, the motion graphic you did first, and then I'll get to, to, to this one. Either way is fine uh, with me. So yeah, I did a motion graphic um, about uh, how heat affects the health of residents, um, so how it affects uh, people with chronic diseases. Um, and I think a motion graphic is a great way um, for people to just visualize um, information and get a better understanding uh, of that. And it gives meaning uh, and life to sort of a set of objects or, or words uh, that you otherwise wouldn't get. So I think it's relatable and personal uh, for the readers to do. And it was just really fun uh, to learn how to make a motion graphic, which I had never uh, done before. And Krishnan was instrumental in sort of teaching the process and how to storyboard and get um, your frames and sort of the text ready for that. And he produced this Row Houses Are Hot uh, infographic, or motion graphic uh, with Maris and Amina, um, which is really great. In Baltimore, many residents live in row houses, a cheap and easily replicable form of housing in which residents share a common wall. Many row houses have black tar roofs and are composed with brick or brick and form stone, all of which absorb and trap heat inside a row house. A lack of tree cover also heats up the concrete streets and sidewalks that surround row houses. The stored heat can make it unbearably hot well into the night. Together, these factors contribute to what's known as the heat island effect that can make an urban area nearly 20 degrees hotter than surrounding rural regions. City um, and just to echo what, um, what Camilla said, um, in creating uh, the motion graphic, um, uh, the one um, Camilla had built and the, and the, the one you just saw that um, Amina uh, Maris and I created, um, the the basic layout was how do we tell this, you know, really esoteric uh, story about a row house? How do we visualize it and simplify it within a minute or, or and change? Um, and so uh, the idea to kind of create a little block um, allowed us to, you know, go inside the, the home, show how heat affects outside the home. How do we compare it to a rural region? And so um, Amina and Maris's, you know, research and reporting and also the storyboarding allowed us to kind of visualize this, conceptualize this, and, and then uh, tell this, you know, kind of complicated story in, in a simplified way. Great. Um... Teresa and Sean, how did you come up with the, the scrolly telling graphic um, overlaying old breadlining maps on the current tree canopy of Baltimore? And how hard was it to gather those maps and, and the satellite data? Hi, hey, thanks for your question, Kathy. Um, so we worked really closely with the Urban Forestry Department of Baltimore, who um, has a lot of efforts underway to increase the amount of trees that are being planted in Baltimore. Um, but as we did more reporting and we looked closely at the neighborhoods that tended to be more hot than others, we found that these neighborhoods almost had a one-to-one -one correlation with the neighborhoods that experienced redlining um, or, you know, more predatory lending. Um, they weren't given loans. Um, and so you can see a direct correlation. The, the neighborhoods that were uh, victims of redlining have less tree coverage. And we were able to get that, a lot of those, like, street level images right from the urban forestry department because they have a very comprehensive um, tree registry where they know the condition and the age and the type of every tree on every block. Um, we know because we went and we double checked a lot of them. <laughs> These maps that are on the screen right now were actually created by another graduate student, uh, Roxanne Reddy. Um, she put a considerable amount of time and effort into the colors and create, making sure that the outlines of each neighborhood are correct. So even though we had the data behind it, a considerable amount went into actually making it visual. Um, but we knew that it was something that we had to do because when you look at the tree cover compared to the temperature, compared to redlining, it just matched up to a really distressing degree, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, just to add that, um, uh, 
this scrolly telling method when you're dealing with a lot of complex data sets and trying to um, uh, make what is a, a nuanced point, guiding people through it step by step is often better than just throwing a bunch of data and information at them at the beginning. That's great. So this is for all of you and you can, you can take turns. What did you learn working on this project that will stay with you? I think that teamwork is really important. I think this project could not have come together if we didn't have data to ground us, uh, the sensors to prove our, uh, what we suspected, um, the photo team willing to come along, the graphics de designers who s labored all summer over reams of numbers to put them into a page where somebody could actually, as Sean said, learn something from it without having to wade through uh, spreadsheets. Um, and I wanna make one more point. Um, we spent weeks fact checking. We fact checked down to, forgive me, Sean. At the end, Sean said, I, uh, we have in some piece here that there is a dead tree on this block. <laughs> but we were on that block in May. Someone needs to drive to that block and make sure that tree has not sprouted leaves. And the students did. So I'd like to make that clear too. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll throw out there that, um, you know, that uh, there is a big movement in journalism to take advantage of um, new technology, um, uh, uh, for finding and telling stories and the sensors we built um, were an example of that. But those would not have worked. Like we could have measured temperature inside of our office um, and that would have been useless for this project um, without the you know old school shoe leather relationship building that went into um, source development on the street and building trust with people. Um, and I, I just think it's um, a good object lesson in um, how new technology and old methods can work together. Um, and I just want to add one more thing to that. So with the sensors, without the sensors, we would have had stories that said, this mother says the room that her children with asthma sleep in is unbearably hot. But with the sensors, we were able to say it was 80 something degrees outside and 107 degrees in that room. And so we, we were able to take it from the anecdotal, which can be very powerful, to something really grounded in science that was just incontrovertible. I have a related note to that actually, Sandy. Um, I think I learned like, uh, Sandy was actually at, during, or at the interview that I'm about to talk about, um, but we talked to a public health expert named Dr. Wilson from the School of Public Health and something that he said has literally stuck with me since, since that day, but he said that climate change like can't just be about polar bears. Um, so this project has really showed me that you need to put a face to, you know, a science-y or a science-related story to have people um, care about the topic. Um, so when you connect it to faith, to community, to health, it really makes it a lot more human-centered and people kind of understand the magnitude of the issue. That's great. Anybody okay. else? Sure. Um, so as someone who started the master's program and I was new to journalism, um, my experience up to Code Red had largely been, you know, me going out and reporting on stories by myself. Um, but for Code Red, I worked as part of the, uh, the data team, and it really opened my eyes to what a collaborative um, effort among journalists could do. Um, like Sandy and Kathy have mentioned, we had the photography team, we had the reporting team, and the quality of Code Red could not have been possible without all of us contributing individual pieces to it. Um, like Maris said, the data that Roxanne and I worked on would not have been nearly as impactful if we hadn't been able to say, these are the people who are actually suffering from the most intense heat. Um, and so I, it, it's made me really excited to work on future collaborative projects because there's just so much you can tackle as a group that you couldn't by yourself. And one of the things I loved watching you all work is that, you know, you had areas of specialty, but you, you crossed over. Um, so, you know, Teresa, you have a, a background in data, but you were also out doing on the ground reporting. 
excuse me, um, and um, you know, that's true of, of all of you. And I think it's what made the project um, work so well um, because you had to have a wider angle view of, uh, of what the stories were. And I just wanted to briefly echo what uh, Teresa um, and, and Kathy said by saying, um, with so many disparate parts and so many moving parts, um, you need some type of project management. And, and what I learned through this process, I mean, and Sean's smiling because he truly was the project management. And if you don't have somebody or a group of people kind of making sure that they kind of have their paws in every pot, then you just have several different people doing several different things and there's no cohesion. So having someone like that, that is, is, you know, can speak everyone's language is so crucial to a big project like this. Yeah. Camilla, anything you want to add? It's all been said, but I'll just echo uh, what, what Sandy and, and Teresa said about it being a collaborative effort and it feeling like a real newsroom, especially for us student journalists. Um, it was my first experience being um, in that sort of environment, um, which made our weekly meetings uh, so special since I spent most of the days inside of Night Hall and not uh, on the streets reporting like uh, my colleagues. Uh, so it felt, I felt like I knew the characters and I knew uh, and I understood what the data, the implications of the data were just from hearing uh, from my colleagues. So that was really valuable. What was the most surprising finding um, for you? Um, and anybody can jump in and, and answer that. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll just mention this. I mean, I knew it was going to be hot in people's houses. I never expected the heat index to be like hitting 120. I mean, that yeah. like literally floored me. I mean, I thought our sensors were wrong, but we calibrated and checked them and we, you know, did a bunch of, uh, a bunch of internal checks to make sure the data we were getting was valid. I think something that stayed with me even now that I think about constantly is how closely neighborhoods that were affected by redlining still continue to suffer today. Um, like we hear about the ongoing impacts of racism all the time, but to have experienced it and seen it myself in such a data driven and experience driven way just blew my mind. Honestly, I, I can't believe that something that happened so many years ago can still be devastating to people's lives and their health today. That's great. Um, I just want to add, um, we hear a lot about uh, climate change deniers or climate change skeptics. We didn't meet anybody who was skeptical about climate change. Everybody was aware of climate change and uh, was aware that it was going to get worse and that they didn't feel the uh, public health response was enough. So for the government to say we're opening a cooling center, uh, a lot of people said the cooling center is a mile and a half away and it's 98 degrees and I'm 70. I'm not walking to the cooling center. So people were very aware of the problem and um, uh, wanted more of a response. Yeah, and I, I keep thinking too, I mean, what's gonna happen this summer when gathering in a cooling center around other people is a, right. not, a, not gonna be a great idea in some of these neighborhoods. Yeah. Kathy, it looks like we've got a few questions um, in the chat that I've passed along to you. I don't know if you can see oh. those or not. Um, um, that would require me to know what I'm doing here, Katie. Uh. <laughs> I, do you, I, could, I would be happy to, uh, to read them out to the panelists if you'd like. That would be fantastic <laughs> if you would not mind. No problem. Um, we've got a question for Maris and Teresa. Uh, it says, working on the streets of Baltimore for six plus weeks, doing interviews and gathering visuals and getting to know the people around McElderry Park, um, is there any one day or one situation that really stands out to you? You want to answer that first, Teresa? Or? Okay. Um, I think for me, um, there were definitely a lot of like standout moments. Um, but one 
in particular was uh, one day we decided to spend the morning with uh, Tammy. Miss um, Tammy, she was an, like sh a really amazing speaker. Like she had a lot of thing really great things to say. Um, but I think what was really startling was uh, just a lot of the personal um, anecdotes and personal experiences that she was sharing with us um, growing up or raising a family and grandchildren with um, asthma and other respiratory diseases or conditions. Um, just hearing that like come directly from someone and how, you know, not having AC like really impacted their health. Like I think just hearing that in person was, you know, it really brought like a, the, a face to the statistic again. I'm gonna fudge the answer a little bit and respond with you too, I'm sorry. Um, I was out there the day that the heat wave struck. It was um, a, over a long weekend, a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and, and the temperatures hit the highest in Baltimore that they would that summer. Um, I just remember being on the street and sweating bullets and being there with my uh, fellow reporter, Ian Round, and um, still, you know, having to hit the pavement and talk to people and see, like, it's the hottest day. What are you doing outside? What are you doing to stay cool? Um, the other one is, uh, I worked a lot on the trees story and uh, Sean and I went to a lot of neighborhoods asking people, you know, when were trees planted? What are the receptions? Do people want trees? And we went to a surprising amount of neighborhoods where people did not want trees planted. It didn't matter that uh, it could bring down the temperature. It didn't matter that people found it just aesthetically pleasing. Um, they either had a history of not being tr of not finding the government trustworthy, or they thought that trees were actually a detriment, would bring things like vermin to their neighborhood. Um, that was the most shocking to me. I didn't expect to get pushback from people about trees. <laughs> That's great. Um, we've got another question um, for anyone on the panel. Um, if you could speak about the reaction of those featured in the stories, um, have you kept in touch with them? Have their lives been impacted at all by your reporting? Yeah, I'll just uh, briefly mention um, one way that we kept in touch with people was um, we did something kind of old school for this project, which was we printed a like a newsletter type version uh, of the stories um, in a condensed version with some of the graphics, um, took them to um, uh, all of the sources we interviewed and talked to um, and uh, also kind of passed them out in the neighborhood. And Sandy, what was the reaction like? I think people were delighted. Um, you know, we had been back to them all summer long um, and most people were very gracious, but um, you know, we're asking to come into your house and look at that sensor and how did last week go? And you were talking about your nephew, how's he? Um, so I think they were really delighted to see, um, here's the result of all of that. And um, I think they also appreciated our calling throughout the project to say, I wanna check this fact. I wanna be sure I quoted you correctly. Um, I think that added to their sense of confidence in us and being able to talk. But um, some of them asked for extra copies. Um, I know that Ian, one of our reporters, left a bunch at the church, which uh, uh, the Lutheran church that we relied on uh, for to talk to people at, at their food pantry, to talk to their volunteers at summer camp programs. Um, so I think that turned out to be a really good way to kind of wrap up um, our work for the summer and um, thank people. Um, we've got a couple of questions about the, the collaboration and the partnerships um, with the project, uh, specifically about uh, working with Wide Angle Youth Media and NPR. Um, if anyone on the, the panel could speak to that and any lessons uh, that you learned from the collaborations and partnerships for the project. Um, Wide Angle took some great pictures uh, to um, that I think are used quite prominently. Um, uh, there are some limitations because they're kids. They can't be out on the street at all hours, but um, they did some really good work for us. Um, and NPR, our students got to, um, uh, you know, we had lined up some interviews that the NPR reporter asked to come along to. And so our students got to watch 
the NPR reporter um, doing her thing, and a lot of people are very interested in audio and radio these days, so I thought that was a real plus for um, the students. In addition, um, as we just said, talking about the teams at our college working together, this just expanded our depth, as Sean said, you know, working with us, uh, bringing more expertise, more ideas, um, you know. The other nice thing about working with NPR um, is that while we focused on Baltimore, they were able to take the methodology that we had developed there and apply it to, I think, 97 other cities. And what they found um, was not only the same patterns that we um, had found in Baltimore, but we found that in some cities, um, uh, it, it was even worse. People living in, in urban heat islands were, were suffering even more than, uh, than they were in Baltimore. And so for me, that gave us confidence that, you know, what we were reporting wasn't an anomaly. It was, it was something that was true in, in almost 100 cities across the country. Um, and I just wanted to add one note about uh, working with um, Wide Angle Youth Media. Um, and for those of you who don't know who they are, they're a, uh, a youth media organization in, um, in Baltimore that educates um, middle school through college age um, youth on how to use camera gear, how to tell stories, how to create documentaries and fiction films. And they often work with professional partners like Under Armour. And so what's super exciting for us um, is uh, you know, they did not have a journalism, a visual journalism curriculum before working with us. And now because of this project, this partnership, they have a visual journalism uh, curriculum that they created. And that's something that they can continue giving to their, um, uh, to their, you know, the people that come in and the young people that want to learn about journalism. And anecdotally, in speaking with some of the wide angle youth that worked with us after they completed this project, a resounding sentiment was that, you know, I've been taking photos to create commercial work and I've been taking photos just for fun, but I didn't really understand what it meant to be a journalist and what journalism is, in the, you know, how it's produced, why it's produced, how it serves the community. And this is an opportunity also for them to really, you know, understand why journalism is so important to the fabric of a community and, and for people to understand outside that community what's happening. And so that was super exciting um, to, to have that be one of the outcomes. Can I add one thing about the uh, another layer of collaboration besides um, collaboration between professional partners and schools uh, was the collaboration between um, sort of the um, professional side of journalism and the academic and research side of journalism. So Krishnan, um, in addition to being an active contributor on this project, um, uh, also is still producing a research um, paper on this uh, designed to look at um, uh, the use of technology and collaboration um, uh, that will be shared with a broader sort of research community, right? Yes, correct. Um, yeah, and I'm working on that as we speak. Um, we have another question um, for the, the student reporters. Do you talk about how long it took you to feel like you established trust with your sources? I think talking from a visual journalism standpoint. So I, I took a lot of the photos and the portraits of um, the residents. I honestly think it took a couple of weeks to establish relationships with them. Like I mentioned, um, having a camera is a little bit more intrusive than just writing things down. Um, so really learning to listen and, you know, let them talk and let them speak their experiences. Um, it took it took a little bit to, to really get them to open up with it to a camera. I agree with Maris, it took quite a few interactions. The, the first time we talked to them, you know, there was a little bit of suspicion, like, what are you doing here? Why are you asking us about our personal lives? Um, but then the more that we came around and showed that we were interested in them as people and not just as resources for a story, 
they were like, oh, okay, maybe they actually care a little bit. And as we got more familiar with the neighborhood, we were able to interact more and just, you know, say hi to passing people and know people's names and people came to know us more. So it wasn't like we were just random journalists dropping in for a day and leaving. It was like they could open up to us about their lives and we could follow up with other information, you know, ask about their kids and just show them that we cared about them as people. Yeah, to, to add on to that, it was definitely just having um, like regular conversations with them. I think Teresa mentioned that it would take like several interactions to like actually, you know, be able to talk to them about sensitive uh, topics. But I think like, like she said, like once you, they really um, figured out that, you know, we weren't there just to like, like write one story and like, you know what I mean? Like write one like little paragraph about their lives. They really like saw the importance of this project. Hey, Katie, can I take one minute um, just to, uh, to thank people who help support this work? Um, I awesome. saw that uh, Norris West from, excuse me, the Casey Foundation is, is on this and we could not have done, <coughs> excuse me, we could not have done this work without um, the support of Casey and the Scripps Howard Foundation. Um, and the other funders who who made it possible, and the fact that, excuse me, we were able to uh, take the the support that they provided for us and and produce a story that um, was read not only from coast to coast but also in uh, in countries around the world um, was huge. So I'll take a minute and say thank you. Kathy, can I also just name check the Online News Association who that, gave, yeah. he gave us a lot of money for censors um, and I think Park also, right? Yep. Yeah, thank you. I totally forgot about Park. Yeah. So, yes, we couldn't do it alone. And, um, and so thank you uh, to all the people who made it possible. Can I jump in for a second? There was an earlier observation uh, about the recommendation to um, just give everybody an air conditioner, which I must say we discussed at great length, was that the best public health service you could do? And what we found in the neighborhoods was people didn't like air conditioning. Uh, row houses are built straight on the street and uh, there was a sense that you could push that air conditioner in and have access to the house. And um, uh, you can't hear as well if somebody is in your house. So um, I just wanted to respond to that question that came early on. Um, maybe everybody would get used to it, but several people told us my son bought me an air conditioner. I never use it. Um, I'm afraid to use it. I don't want it. Um, so the, the issue is pretty complicated. Yeah, just to add on to that, Sandy, you know, a thing we found in our reporting is that um, in Baltimore and other cities too, the regulations around you know, temperature control in people's apartments were so much more skewed towards making sure people had heat in the winter than keeping them cool in the summer. And that's something that, um, you know, will have to be addressed uh, as the climate continues to warm. Well, thank you very much to everyone um, for joining us this evening. And thank you to, to Kathy and all of our panelists. Um, hopefully you all learned a lot this evening about this wonderful project. Um, we will send an email out um, with the link to the full video. So if you came in late um, or weren't able to, to see the whole thing, um, and we'll also include a link to the project um, itself. So you can read some of those stories um, and look at some of the graphics that we shared up on the screen this evening. Um, so thank you very much to everyone. Uh, have a good evening. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Thank Bye. you very much, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you.